Oh, it's at 7 o'clock. I think I'm going to get the meeting started. I'm Eric, and I'm uh, the chair of this organization. I want to thank you for being here. Um, we got snacks in the back. As we get a few more stragglers coming back in. I um, uh, just want to first thank you for being here, and second, uh, say we got a really excellent meeting tonight. Surprise guest visit from uh, Craig Dirksen. Not on the agenda, but extraordinarily warmly welcome. Um, hope you're. Hope you can make it through the meeting. We'll get you in and out of here. Um, sure, will be fine. Uh, quick. Excellent. If I stand up, it's not because I can sense that something was said, it's because I need to take it straight off. Then is that permission to say anything we want? Absolutely. Excellent. We'll get away with bloody murder then. Um, I also want to uh, recognize Cindy Dower, who's going to be uh, um, presenting towards the uh, end of the meeting. and uh, She's a staffer of the Westside Cultural Alliance, uh, an organization I'm affiliated with. Um, and uh, with that being said, what I'd like to do is uh, in just a moment or two get uh, our Sheriff's Department uh, um, uh, brought into the play. You guys have had a busy, busy day, busy week, and Aloha has... Uh, Lowe's got Lowe's gone dry. Where's all the weed, man? <laughs> did you yeah. did you bring in? <laughs> did you get this party started? Um, I need to have you over to bake brownies for the next CPO meeting. <laughs> okay. All right. Huh. Well, enough of those jokes. Um, uh, a couple quick uh, things that I want to let you know about is that. Uh, um, I got an impassioned plea from uh, our library director, Doug Hoy. Doug has stated that we've got an opportunity to match yet another $10,000. So if uh, someone from the library, hello, Carla. Um, uh, if someone uh, wants to make a donation, it will be matched up to $10,000 currently. And I think uh, the library is going to be a very, very exciting place. And I think you're going to see some press releases come out that uh, are going to Blow your mind with what's coming around the, the, the door next. But I'll let the press and uh, the president of the library uh, disclose that at a later date. Um, outside of that, I'd have to say that we have a lot of uh, uh, large scale land use decisions coming down with South Hillsboro, South Cooper Mountain. Uh, I also, also want to recognize uh, both John Tyner and especially Steve Lawrence for, and Karen Bolin as well for providing testimony at the uh, uh, Hillsboro Planning Commission for the TSP update. So that's something that uh, I thought was um, uh, really interesting. Come on up, ladies. We'll get you another chair. Bring it right up here. You're important. Sit front row. Um, outside of that, I'd say uh, there's a lot of stuff percolating in the background. And I'm a resource for you, as is um, uh, the OSU staff and uh, other folks. Where most of the current information is, uh, you're going to find is with uh, our Facebook page at Facebook dot com slash cpo6 aloha and if you like that page you'll get updates and that's where a lot of uh, hyper local and regional issues are, are being presented uh, i also want to thank anthony mills because he does a great job of posting liking and sharing stuff it really helps me keep that page alive with that being said i'm uh detective matt yes you in the corner Hello. Uh, I'm curious if uh, you want to come and uh, give us an update. Yeah, sure. Can I wire you up and push on the camera? Oh, my. Sure. Yeah, it, it is. It is. But the lady's like a man on TV. Okay. Put that in your pocket because I'm not going there. And okay. you're live. All right. Is this thing on? It's oh. just, for the, just for the camera. I wish so. I could stand over here so I'm out of the range of the camera, but it keeps moving it. So it's kind of yeah, weird. that's uh, that's leadership. We spent $115 on the camera and had to track you. Oh, okay. I'm just upset I had to follow the Burning Man thing because I feel like anything I say is going to be really boring now. Uh, you know what? You put that on in the background. <laughs> <laughs> you got yeah. a <laughs> How about, this is one of the things I was thinking is that we could use that if when people are going through um, uh, the processing to become inmates at the local jail, we could show that and suggest that that's what happens next. <laughs> as a way, well, maybe I, I'm just going to sit down and show you what you take over here. All right. <laughs> so I brought the newsletter, as usual, back over here. And I brought some calls for service for Aloha in general, because as you know, our beats that we work at the sheriff's office don't exactly meet exactly with the CPO and how it's broken down. So. We see calls for service in there, burglaries, trespasses, thefts. Just because that call was dispatched doesn't necessarily mean that that's a crime actually occurred there or that exact crime occurred there. So it's kind of a general guideline. Um, we've had a pretty busy couple days, just general calls for service. 
Um, you know, kind of going from call to call to call. So, you know, usually during the hot weather, that's when we get all that stuff. But it seems like now that it's starting to rain and get kind of muggy, we're getting it. I'm not sure why. So, usually I open it up kind of at the end for questions, comments. But I think a lot of people have questions tonight. So maybe I'll just go ahead and do that right now. Do it. So, hands in the air if anybody has a question or even a general question about anything. Well, not anything. I can't answer a lot of stuff. Can you address the Aloha drug bus? So I can only say a couple things about that. It was an interagency kind of cooperative affair with the feds and, and local law enforcement. Um, we did several search warrants, uh, and it's an ongoing investigation. And really, that's kind of all I can say. We did a press release probably about an hour or two ago, so that might have a little bit more information. So our public information officer, Sergeant Bob Ray, put together a nice little information packet for everybody. So... Come on, you guys are usually way better. Than I think mean, <laughs> about it. Is it just various people you're just going after? It's kind of a related issue. Everybody's related in it. It's not just a separate person. They're not A's not related to B. If that makes sense. I got one. Always good for question. How about Mabel first? Go ahead. How long do we have to put up with dog barking? With <laughs> dog barking. So you must live in my neighborhood. County noise ordinance covers covers dog barking. And it covers it pretty much 24 hours a day. If you have a dog that's barking, 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 and bugging you, you can give us a call through non-emergency dispatch, and we can go talk to the person. Generally, the first time we talk to that person, they're not going to get a citation. But if it keeps going on and on and on, they're going to get cited for it. Someone told me it was just five minutes, and I could call it in. Yeah, usually, if it's five enough to bother you, if it's loud and ongoing. Most people call up for like a half an hour or so, and it's been going on forever and okay. ever. What happens, though, if I call in, and the person working all day long, and I'm listening to the dog bark all day long. Of course, you're going to go and try and knock, but you can't knock on their door because the dog's in the front yard. And mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't know. The deputies are usually pretty resourceful, so we can usually get around certain things But if like they're that. gone, that how do you notify them that you... We can usually leave a note for them, a business card, or okay. we can look at Karma's history and call their phone number and say, hey, this is Deputy Humphrey. I responded okay. about 3 o'clock this afternoon. Ongoing issue. I have three neighbors walk up to me and say your dog barks all the time. In the future, you might be cited for that, and so that usually helps with things. Now, if they're just not home, or when we get there and the dog's not barking, we have to witness the violation to do something about that. But give us a call. Obviously, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we are always on duty. So Go ahead. I have a question. So, uh, then is it on record who called in? No, you can remain anonymous to the dispatcher, or you can just tell the dispatcher that you want to be anonymous. Regardless, I never go up and say, hey, the neighbor over there. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I want so to So if you want to retaliate, go to her house. <laughs> <laughs> Usually that's pre kept pretty confidential because it doesn't really add anything except someone's like, oh, I hate you now. Yeah. So. Well, in our neighborhood, there's four little yappers, and they get, and then they're running in and out of the house all the time, barking constantly all day long. I really didn't want to call unless... Well, I knew it could be anonymous. And it's not a big deal to call. A lot of times we just go talk to the folks and they'll say, you know, I'm sorry, or I didn't realize, or something of that nature. Is everybody kind of familiar with non-emergency dispatch? Yeah. 6290111, when it's not an emergency, it's not a burglary, you're not being stabbed to death or anything like that. If you are, please call 911 if you can. <laughs> okay. Eric, go ahead. I just got a call from the Washington County Sheriff's Office probation and parole department Wasn't asking for $800 to be placed on a green dot card, and I gave it to them. What did they do wrong? Um, they probably did, we didn't probably get it because we don't really? do that. Okay, because they said I had a warrant out for my arrest. Right. So okay, everybody familiar with what a warrant is, right? A judge basically signs something that says you shall bring this person into custody because they committed this crime. Um, in a grand jury, possibly sometimes they have what's called a secret indictment. That's where we get enough evidence together and say Joe Smith did this crime, and the, and the grand jury will say, okay, we're going to go ahead and sign a secret indictment and we're going to issue a warrant without that person even knowing about it. The only way to clear out a warrant is for a deputy to arrest you and take you to the jail. There is no other way around it. Absolutely not. Unless a judge that signed it decides that he's going to somehow rescind that warrant, which I've never seen happen myself. You can't pay your way out of it. You can't negotiate with it. It's an order from a judge for a police officer to arrest you. So we can't say, well, I don't feel like it today. So. We will never call and say, hey, you know, we need money, and we'll never say we need it through Western Union or Green Dot or any of that things, because we're a little higher class than that, right? Um, just a little. 
Um, so anytime anybody calls you and says, hey, you know, you owe money to a collection service, otherwise we're going to send the police to arrest you, nope, 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 nope. Be very cautious about anybody who calls you and says, hey, it's Johnny, and I need bail money, and I'm in Mexico. Anything that's out of the ordinary that doesn't pass a sniff test is probably some sort of scam. So it's been happening in Washington County. It has. Uh, well, they're they're falsif mm -hmm. Yeah, they're falsifying. The reason I phrase my question that way is that there's currently scam activity, and they'll call and say, you need to clear up a warrant for you, your spouse, and they'll lie. What's really odd is they want you to load a prepaid debit card, and some people are falling for the stupidity. So you shouldn't do that, and if you can, uh, just uh, alert law enforcement, because that's just, that's fraud, that's criminal activity. Absolutely. Sir? How long does it take to, for the response, usually, on a non-emergency call? Well, when you call a non-emergency dispatch, it's actually the same dispatchers that will answer your 911 call. They just know that something emergent is not really happening at that point. You might be reporting a cold fraud, or somebody broke into your shed a week ago, or somebody slashed your tires. The response can vary because your priority of your call depends on what you actually call in. So if suddenly we have an assault with a weapon that comes out while I'm on the way to your cold fraud, I'm gonna probably get sent to that, and however long that takes, whether I'm the primary deputy or just a backup guy. And then after that, I might be on my way to your call again, and a traffic crash comes out, and now I have to go to that. So it's real hard. I mean, a lot of times when a call comes out, we try to take them immediately. The deputy can select a call or the dispatcher can just send it to him or her. But it's hard to give you kind of a window. Today I took a, uh, a call that was a uh, graffiti at a school and it had come out at 9.30 this morning and I didn't get to it till about 1.30. And it was a very simple call. Well, the reason I asked is because last Thursday, uh, I kind of had uh, somebody had been kicking in the fence boards oh, okay. on my mom's fence, mm -hmm. and um, it's just been happening over kind of consistently, especially on weekends, and uh, so I uh, repaired it all, mm -hmm. and then put some, they were all the kicks were right about 30 inches off the ground in the same kind of nice karate spot, and so I put a, a whole new horizontal right at that elevation, thinking, well, okay, now we're okay, Sure. but I didn't reinforce couple spots right around where it goes around a tree and stuff. So anyhow, while I was up testifying about South Hillsborough, back within hours after I was done fixing the fence, kerboom, they kicked in a, a whole section of the fence and some more boards. Is this and like a good shortcut for people or no, something? Or? No, no, there's no real reason to do it except for, you know, it's Hi. my turf, you know, so. Uh, but it's right on uh, 198. It's right on the corner of 209th and Kim. Okay. Okay, so, I mean, there's no real sure shortcut to be made. Just it's trying to figure out what's the motivation. Is motivation. Right. So I called uh, and talked to the dispatch on the non-emergency, and, and she said, well, I'll have somebody call you back. They'll probably call you back within an hour. I said, cool, because I'm, I'm just leaving town, and so sure. I'll hang around for an hour. And so about an hour went by, and I didn't hear back. So I called back again. She said, well, I said, I understand. You know, there's a lot going on, you know, but I'll hang out for a while longer. So I hung out for another 45 minutes. I never heard back, but I got a call back again. In 40, uh, about four hours later, okay. on my message machine, and uh, they said, "Well, that's great, Steve, but I can't take any complaint from you. I need to take it from your mom. Well, my mom's 95 and blind, and sure enough, in a foster care home. So, you know, that just seemed kind of odd to me. That, you know. Well, generally, unless you ask dispatch to have a deputy call you back, we will always show up in person. Yeah, well, that's what they wanted to do. Call right. She, she said, "Oh, I will call you back. Do you want?" Then they'll come by and take a complaint. Okay, and if you if you request us to be there in person, of course we'll always show up in person. Rarely do I just call somebody because I like to kind of see the people and what's going on. Mm -hmm. And certainly, I would be happy to take a complaint from you, kind of for your mom. I have no problem with that whatsoever. That's funny. I just thought that that was kind of odd. So it I is did, a little odd. That's something I've never really heard of before. Well, what I did while I was kind of fuming, sure. I wrote a little sign out like this and put it on the fence that said, "Hey, to the guy that's uh, kicking in this fence." Uh, you should be really proud of yourself because you kicked in the fence of a 95-year-old woman. Tell all your friends you're the man. <laughs> and uh, when I came back, the sign was gone, but no more damage had been done. Oh, well, maybe his friends saw it first and gave him a bad time. Maybe. <laughs> That's interesting. We always want you to be satisfied with our service, so obviously if you're not getting 
um, the service that you hope for from a deputy, you might need to speak to another deputy or feel free to talk to a supervisor like Sergeant McCray back there. I don't have any other questions. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody have any general questions about any? Well, not anything. I should stop saying that. Um, well, there you go. Parking violations. Okay. Parking too close to a school crossing. Okay. Is that something that you've been cited for? Or? No, I haven't been cited, but in our neighborhood, we have a school, and we have issues with the fact that there's no stop sign, and I've sent messages to everywhere that I can. Uh, there's only a school crossing, Okay. and uh, there's a lot of people that park very close, particularly okay. a neighbor that lives over there okay. in that corner, and he parks right, I think it's 20 feet away mm -hmm. from the school crossing. Well, he parks right there, and he, and he has a huge trailer, okay. which, by the way, has no license. So it kind of blocks the view of the crossing? It blocks the view from the crossing. Okay. And, uh, Have you ever called us about it? Oh, yeah. Has any action ever been No, taken? not call you, but actually call the traffic control uh, people, and okay. I send an email regarding that, because the school is located... Uh, it's right on that corner over there, and that's the only entry to the school. There should be a stop sign in there, and there's nothing. Okay. It's a little kid's school. Well, I, and I'm not sure and if I, I understand. I don't know where to go. Or I'm not sure if I understand where the stop sign is. Is it more like on public properties, on the school property, or is it kind of a no. street? Would no, it be a street thing? What's that mean? She's saying there isn't a stop no, sign. No, there is. Where would it be, though? Would it be on the school property? In the location. In the street. Uh, the location is on Stoddard Drive okay. and Florence. Okay. The school is on Florence. Okay. That's the entry to it. That's the entry to it, which is a very short. Uh, What's the name of the school? Butternut Creek. Butternut. Butternut, Butternut Creek. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's well, no stop sign. Actually, Stoddard is just a thoroughfare. So if it's going to be a stop sign, like out on a city street or something like that, yeah. it's probably going to be land use and transportation. I send them an email, two emails, and they never answer. Okay. Regarding that. For enforcement action for no, somebody no, illegally no. parking or being a hazard, that would be us. Okay. We would come out and take a look. If somebody's a hazard or is parked illegally, they'd either be cited mm -hmm. or towed or both. Okay. Especially if it's causing a hazard to the kids. All right. Even so if it's on the weekends, I can call and You can call us 24 hours a day. Okay. We never right. close. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions, comments, outrageous remarks? Go ahead, sir. Has there been any crackdown on people on cell phones? Yes, we did some, uh, I think with the traffic <laughs> team did some sweeps regarding that recently. And obviously the cell phone law did change from the initial law. I guess I'll remember a few years ago where it was something that we couldn't necessarily stop somebody for. If we had the car stopped and somebody was using a cell phone, we could address it. Then it got changed to be a violation just like anything else, speeding or fail to obey traffic control device or something of that nature. So, and you no longer can use it for work purposes and things right. of that nature. So it can't be used by anybody for work purposes now, is that no. what Essentially, yes, that's true. And even the sheriff's office, we have orders coming down from our management that says that we're not supposed to be using it either while our car is moving, just for safety purposes, and to kind of set a good example. Sir? Now you just mentioned while your car is moving, if a person is sitting at a stoplight, not moving, can they be texting or talking on their phone? Well, it says while you're operating your vehicle, I think is what the statute actually says. So you could argue either way. Um, you know, are you operating your vehicle while you're sitting there at the stoplight? You know, because are you paying attention to everything that's going on? Is the guy in front of you gone now and you're sitting there doing this? Still texting, right? Yeah. Right. And it, the statute addresses some stuff on the phone pretty specifically. Communication, essentially. So you could argue, if you want to be argumentative, um, that maybe you're looking at Google Maps, or maybe you're looking at your book you downloaded, right? My recommendation would be to follow it just what the law, basically the spirit of the law is, which is pay attention when you're driving. That yeah, because normally even though you're stopped at a stoplight, your car is in drive, and you've got your foot on the brake, so you really should be. So I would argue, what I'd argue you're operating at that point. What prompted it? You mentioned it was an area of discussion. That's what my wife and I were talking about. Oh, okay, yeah. I figured that it was it was an event. Mm -hmm. Folks, I'm going to keep this meeting moving along, and I'm going to ask for some applause for Matt because he's not the deputy. Yeah. And I'm going to just really push the limits of good taste and ask for some additional applause for some people we didn't hear from, and that's uh, Earl McRae and Earl Shore. Uh, 
both of them do an amazing job, and uh, Darlene really does a, a lot of stuff uh, uh, that is done in front and behind the scenes, such as the, what's the, the neighborhood program you taught last, was it? Uh, neighborhood Watch? Na not the Neighborhood Watch. Business is Watch? There's a safety one where we learn how to turn off uh, propane tanks. Oh, uh, Map Your Neighborhood. Map Your Neighborhood was an outstanding program. This is just one of like, which one do I teach? Like, I teach a whole bunch. And uh, Errol McRae has given some great updates as well. I want to thank all three of you for being here. I really appreciate that. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, get um, our Metro Councilors uh, um, up front and center uh, because uh, one of them's not feeling well. And one of them, and both of them are just playing awesome, and I'm so happy to have both of them here. Um, I got to see uh, Councillor Dirksen up at um, one of the neatest, newest amenities that CPO6 has, which is the Ver or Paul and Verna Winkleman Park. And I'm kind of shocked by how much traffic we have for dogs. There's a dog facility up there, and uh, it's, we have some happy dogs and some happy owners because these people have a chance to use a new amenity. Now, I kind of, I was on the um, Citizen Advisory Committee and had a hand in that, and um, I kind of wish that it was in THPR District proper. It's just barely outside of it, but uh, it's just a great facility that's actually walking distance from my house, which I really love. But without me babbling on too much further, what I'd like to do is, um, are you both going to present, or? Uh, okay, so you're supervising? I'm uh, here to do Q&A along with I'll let you. Um, th thank you for, both for being here. Councilor, you want to take it away? Yes, thank you. So thank you for sharing your agenda time with us tonight for uh, another update on what's been happening at Metro, your regional government. So occasionally there are new faces at uh, CPO meetings. So I brought the pictorial brochure of what is Metro, your regional government, and our unique portfolio of responsibilities. A bit of brand new news, hot off the press, is the lions up at the zoo, one of the female lions is expecting uh, some cubs, perhaps in the next 10 days, so that's pretty exciting news. Uh, the lions, as you might recall, are, are new to the zoo, or back at the zoo as of about four or five years ago, they've been gone for a number of years, but a new exhibit opened, Predators of the Ser Serengeti. And uh, we were hoping that someday we would have some new lions, and in fact, that's happening. Another brochure that I brought for you are hard copies of Green Scene. Uh, these are generally available at libraries throughout the area. Uh, but all the information is also available electronically, but whenever I come to CPO meetings, I bring the latest edition. This one is marked the summer edition because summer for our seasons goes through the end of September. And the, winter, the fall issue will be available starting October 1st. And what's fun about this issue is that it highlights two of your regional parks. Blue Lake Regional Park, which is just off of I-84 uh, in the Fairview area, as well as Oxbow Regional Park, which is just outside of Troutdale. They turned 50 years old. Uh, so they're really uh, unique and really cool places. Blue Lake has a lot of amenities for families and groups. Blue Lake itself for people to go fishing or out on uh, paddle boats. Swimming is there, uh, but just this within the last year, we've opened a uh, national caliber disc golf course, and um, we have a local resident here in Washington County, the Luis Nava's daughter, uh, is a national junior champion, uh, and they just had their first national caliber tournament uh, just a couple of weekends ago that brought in additional visitors to our region, which means they brought their travel dollars here, which helps hire more people and raises the, the tax revenue here in our state that helps provide for education and other services that are valuable for us. So as listed in the CPO newsletter, just a few brief updates for you. Um, we, at, like all public agencies, we finished our fiscal year budget at the end of June, and it's been our fourth year of uh, budget cuts uh, with cuts.
provide public resources. And that's not of particular interest to highlight to you, but rather what I wanted to let you know is with our uh, budget hard decisions we've had to make, we've needed to cut back, particularly in our planning and transportation department. And many folks within our local CPOs utilize Metro staff for a lot of Q&A, especially when there are large community planning efforts, such as with South Hillsboro, or now happening with South Beaverton. And uh, with these cutbacks, what it means is we might not be quite as timely in our response as you've been used to in the past. Metro staff will still get back to you, but it might take them an extra day or so. That's all. So I just wanted to let you know. We're still committed to that customer service, and we'll try as best as we can. Uh, but I wanted to give you some explanation about why there might be a little bit of a delay there. Back in May, voters throughout the region uh, supported the natural areas levy on the ballot. The work program has now been approved for that. So improvements have been made at different parks throughout the region, and restoration efforts are underway as you approved through that ballot item. Uh, then we also have committed through that levy program that there will be an annual report as well. And speaking of annual reports, both of the two bond measure programs that you approved uh, at Metro, the Natural Areas Bond Program and the Zoo Bond Program, those have citizen oversight committees that issue annual reports. And the Zoo uh, Citizen Oversight Committee issued their report in the month of June. And you can find that on the Zoo website, OregonZoo.org. Speaking of the zoo bond measure, two new exhibits are underway, Elephant Lands, to expand the elephant exhibit to just over six acres, providing the elephants with choice. Do they want to be inside? Do they want to be outside? Do they want to go play in the sand, or do they want to go play in the water? They'll get to choose. But in addition, there are improvements for you. Right now, you view the elephants at ground level, and you'll still be able to see the elephants at eye level, so to speak but the exhibit will also offer you opportunities from above so you can look down. So construction of that will take a good couple of years, but uh, I like to know how things are built, and we try through the construction programs to explain what's happening uh, and so forth. Uh, especially, you know, kids like to know that kind of stuff too, how things are built and, and the mechanicry of that. The Condor exhibit is also under construction. You may know that we've been involved with uh, increasing the population of condors here uh, in, in the western United States through a facility in Clackamas County. Uh, we also have some condors that are, are injured and therefore can't live in uh, the wild any longer, and those are the condors that will be part of this new condor exhibit. And Lewis and Clark, when they came through the Pacific Northwest, they observed these con the condors. So there's a lot of history with condors in our area, and we're really proud to help support uh, the, the resurgence of that species here in North America. I would just like to say that uh we're excited about those two, <coughs> excuse me, those two venues that are being built. When all of the planned improvements have been made that will be funded by the zoo bond, you will see about 40% about of the zoo will have been redone as a result of that, and bringing, upgrading things, improving habitat, improving ability for people to enjoy the animals, and also improving the animals' lives by capitalizing on things we've learned about animals in in the meantime, so that it's a, a better existence and living experience for them as well. Exactly. That's already happened with the penguin exhibit, the penguinarium. Uh, the filtration system has been put in, uh, so that's pretty exciting. On a different front, uh, we've been moving forward with a, a hotel project to help support the business at the Oregon Convention Center. 
that venue, the convention center, brings in outside travelers and their dollars to our area, thereby employing more people, especially in the hospitality business, and increasing the revenue levels here in our state for other programs that are very important to us as a community. So we have lots of groups who have been saying for years and years and years that they want to come to Portland, great convention center, national caliber, one of the few green convention centers in the nation. They really like Portland, but they don't like the fact that the hotels are all across the river. They want a hotel that's right across the street from the convention center. So we've been hearing this for years and have done everything we can. We've exhausted all other avenues for continuing to attract their business and securing it through other means. We now have a proposal. We had a proposal uh, early in my tenure as a Metro Council, but the numbers didn't work out, and so that's why the Council stopped pursuing it. But we have a new proposal now for a privately owned, privately operated hotel that would provide for at least a 500, uh, a block of 500 rooms for these conventions, and they would be held for 18 months in advance of the convention. But because it would be built to support the convention center, unlike just a standard hotel, it would also need to provide additional ballroom space and meeting space. And that's the reason why our, the proposal that we've been working on with the city of Portland and Multnomah County and the private development uh, construction group would provide for us to help buy down the cost of those convention-oriented amenities. So the public sector would really only be providing a very small uh, portion of the financing pie. The private sector would continue to fund over 60% of this. Uh, so we're, we have an intergovernmental agreement that we're working on finalizing with the City of Portland and Multnomah County. We hope to have that uh, completed by the end of September so that we can then go through the final negotiations uh, with the development company on this hotel. So you've been reading articles in the newspaper about this, um, and I expect you'll continue to see some right up until construction's done. It would provide for not only those about 2,000 construction jobs, but uh, at least uh, four to 600 permanent uh, positions at that hotel, permanent jobs. So let me pause there and see if there are any questions. Yes, Len. I was just going to ask you if you were taking questions during your presentation. <coughs> does, does Metro get any revenue from the convention center? I mean, do we make money from it? Yeah, there is inter what's called enterprise revenue from the convention center. Uh, it isn't 100% uh, profitable towards that end because of the um, capital improvements that need to be made for that facility. Uh, it's very close to profitable, but not 100%. The Metro General Fund does provide some subsidy for the convention center. But, but while Metro doesn't make a profit on the convention center, activity at the convention center brings over $100 million of income into the region that goes directly to businesses throughout the Portland metro area, uh, other hotels, restaurants, uh, taxi cabs, uh, everything. Uh, none of that money go comes through Metro. We don't get it. It goes directly to the businesses that are providing the goods and services. Mm -hmm. So even though the Metro government doesn't turn a profit on it, the, the region sees a profit. profit. As does the state too yeah. with the, the income taxes that those employees pay and of course the other hotels and other businesses like the restaurants that benefit from those the visitor business provide property taxes as well. So uh, that's why it's of economic interest to the state and why the state legislature uh, provided $10 million of lottery funds for this hotel project. And then the new, uh, the convention hotel will be a similar type of thing. I mean a similar revenue, I mean you know it will give revenue to the different organizations that, that run it and to the local area. 
It will be privately owned yeah. and privately operated. And the business plan, Hyatt uh, Corporation, Hyatt Hotels, will be the owner and operator, and they would only do so if it would make money for them uh, as, as a hotelier as and well. they own the land, too? They will, as a result of once the hotel is constructed, the developer who owns the land and is developing the hotel will then sell it per this agreement to so you're not Hyatt. keeping a lease? No, no, not at all. Okay. No. And we, right now, we don't own the land either. Okay. Uh, PDC is involved with that. Yeah. One of the concerns that we've heard expressed is from the hotel industry, and their concern that a large hotel like this would be competition to them, and is it fair to have a hotel that, to some extent, is being publicly subsidized? But one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is, is that even though the hotel, which will be a 600-room hotel, will hold blocks of 500-room blocks uh, uh, that would be available for conventions, when we bring in the seven to 10 national conventions that we would be eligible for because we would now have the hotel space, many of those conventions need a thousand plus rooms. So the, the convention center hotel would, would be able to provide five to 600, but all the other hotels would see increased business as well. That, that hotel will also be near the Rose Garden because when we had the, when we had the NCAA playoffs here in town, the news said that it left, I don't know how many millions of dollars in town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's one reason why the Trailblazers organization has been very supportive of this project all along. And the majority of hotel owners and operators throughout downtown Portland, as well as through the region, are supportive of this as well. For example, uh, hoteliers out, in, out and near Mount Hood very much support the, this project because they know when there are conventions in town, they get additional business. That's your weekend staying. revenue, your weekend activities. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> yes. We're hearing the same thing from uh, out here in Washington County in white yeah. country, mm -hmm. the same reason. Yeah, yeah. So this has a lot of value for everyone. Uh, so changing the topic entirely over to uh, trails and active transportation. Uh, just this spring, there was a new report on regional trail accomplishments. That's available at our website. Uh, you might be interested in that. That's a good snapshot of what's been happening throughout our region to build more trail facilities uh, and plan new trail facilities. So I just wanted to, to mention that. The West Side Trail Master Planning effort, uh, we went through a final round of open houses on the master plan in May. There were two different open houses that we supported uh, up in the Tigard area as well as held up in the Bethany area. And those comments are being incorporated into the final um, master plan that will be presented and adopted by the Metro Council this fall. So I think somewhere around October or so. Uh, also, uh, the Council Creek master plan for a new trail from the uh, westerly side of Hillsboro through the city of Cornelius onward through the city of Forest Grove and then potentially up to uh, north to Banks and hooking up with the Banks Vernonia Trail. Master planning has, is just starting on that now uh, so that will be uh, very interesting to see <coughs> over time and then as a region uh, a stakeholder advisory committee has just completed a recommendation to all of us on a first ever active transportation plan that really knits together local plans throughout our areas so that we provide for more options for you for walking, bicycling, and access to transit. So it really leverages information that's in Washington County's TSP, for those of you who are following that detail. Transportation system plan. Right, yeah, that was mentioned earlier. Uh, and I don't recall if CPO6 had Shelley Euler in, uh, as other CPOs had on yeah. the Washington County Bicycle and Pedestrian Design Guide. Uh, other CPOs, at least in my district, uh, took advantage of that. So. Just a couple of other things to mention real quick. 
Uh, regional tra uh, trans transportation option grants were awarded in April. Several of them benefit businesses and employees here in Washington County. Uh, the uh, Westside Transportation Alliance uh, has programs uh, going on here. Kaiser Permanente has received a grant to provide for electric assist bicycles at different facilities they have here in Washington County. Uh, PCC also has received a grant, uh, and there are a couple of others as well. Uh, community planning and development grants, we just finished approving uh, that round of planning grants. So that's what's fostering, for example, uh, the, the um, South Beaverton planning efforts that are going on. These are the kind of dollars that helped with some of the funding for the South Hillsboro planning that you're all familiar with. Uh, some other projects that are being funded include uh, some industrial redevelopment planning that needs to happen throughout Washington County. So we're pleased to finally have those dollars available so that these very important local projects can, can uh, be pursued. Uh, then just one, one other grant program I'd like to mention, the Nature and Neighborhood Grants. Uh, two, set of grants there, capital grants from the bond measures. Uh, we have four different grants in other parts of the region that received funding. For example, uh, the White Oak Savannah in West Lynn, uh, but also restoration and enhancement grants. And I really want to make sure to mention this because as a result of the natural areas levy passing, we'll be able to triple the amount of money available for future grant rounds for nature and neighborhood grants. And why I want to make sure you're aware of this program is that these are dollars that you can take advantage of, not only for public properties such as restoration efforts in parks, but also on private property. So for property owners that may have uh, creeks, whether they're seasonal or permanent, running through their property, feeding into Butternut Creek and other creeks that are part of the Tualatin River watershed, you may be interested in this program because you can get resource help to pay for, for example, uh, any excavation work that needs to happen to do some clearing or to pay for the native species that are needed in the planting. So it's nature and neighborhoods, restoration and enhancement grants, and if you have any trouble finding information, uh, I'll circulate my card around. Uh, Craig as well, you can contact so either one of us mm -hmm. and we will point you to those resources. And we do have Metro staff who want to engage with you to help you put together strong grants to take advantage of this program. And I would like to compliment, Mike is here, Mike Dahlstrom from Washington County. Washington County and Clean Water Services, which is under the Washington County Board of Commissioners, are a really great partner in working on programs like this. Uh, so please, please do take advantage of them. Uh, so there's just one more topic to highlight. Uh, Craig was here earlier this spring and brought you up to speed on Southwest Corridor, and they, the steering committee has just, uh, just hit a major milestone, and so he wants to make sure or I want to make sure that he gives you that expert information on that. As we're looking at all the different transportation options through the Southwest Corridor, which is a, a corridor, imagine, about a mile wide with sort of with, with Barber Boulevard going down the center of it and going all the way from the south end of downtown Portland all the way out to Sherwood. And looking at all the different transportation options, land use options, even looking at parks and open space options. and. Uh, uh, we started out with using the land use plans and transportation plans for all of the communities along that corridor. So we began with a huge amount of information and a huge number of different options that could be looked at. A large part of the program has been kind of whittling them down to a manageable amount that we could consider. In particular, looking at the options available for eventual high capacity transit as we look for increases in transportation, increases in the number of trips through the corridor over the next 10, 20, 50 years. What kinds of improvements do we need to do in that corridor 
to take that kind of burden and not end up with gridlock and ruining people's quality of life trying to live in a corridor, the reason why we all moved there in the first place. And uh, reduce those to, first of all, identifying the need to make improvements to local bus service, local transit service, but then also be able, being able to provide a, a, a core line through the, the corridor of high capacity transit that all those of that local service can tie into to carry large capacity of people up and down the <coughs> corridor. And decided that starting with about 12 different options, reduced that to about five. Now we've dropped it down to two to explore. It's either going to be uh, a light rail option or something called bus rapid transit, which is a vehicle that's about half the size of a light rail vehicle but it runs on rubber tires. Other than that, looks much like uh, a train vehicle with uh, running, for the most part at least, in its own dedicated transit way. So it's not running in mixed traffic, blocking that traffic and being restricted by that traffic as well. So those are the two options that we're going to continue to explore. Now that we have it down to just two, we can afford to really look at them head to head and see which one pencils out the best and what kind of timeline that we would want to start looking at when the volume of traffic would make it necessary for that uh, kind of capacity to be in place. So it's still an ongoing process. We have about a whole other year before we come down to what you consider the preferred alternative, which is a, a legal term that the federal government uses that you must identify what the preferred local alternative is before you'd be able to apply to the federal government for money to help you do those kinds of projects. So. Another aspect of the project that I think is <coughs> really uh, excited about is the shared investment strategy. Mm. This is one of the first corridor studies taking a new approach of, it's not just about transportation, but looking at the economic development and job <coughs> opportunities and needs through this large mm. area looking at what is happening with green spaces and parks and uh, the natural ecosystem. So for example- And, and even road improvements too, highway improvements. Yeah, yeah. the um, park providers, uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, all got together and looked at the green spaces, the mitigation areas for example, and learned more about what each of the other was doing that it was a meeting that they didn't, they'd never had before. And so they learned more about how they could leverage one another's uh, energies and investments for the benefit of not only your clean water for drinking water, but for storm water and for water for fish and wildlife habitat. So that is one example of something that's pretty, pretty exciting through the uh, scope of this project. And the shared investment strategy is, would allow uh, jurisdictions who are interested to say, well, if we invest, we want to do X and you want to do Y, and if we do it in the same sort of time frame, we can get some more efficiencies or we can get a better result if we stage those things together. So I think that's another great outcome of a program like this. Where would that terminate? Um, currently, they're discussing whatever the high capacity transit would be would probably terminate in Tualatin, and then it would include an, an enhanced probably bus service from Sherwood up to that terminus point. Uh, the, the figures just don't pencil out for the ca capacity to make it worthwhile to put a high capacity transit line all the way down to Sherwood. It's just that once you get past Tualatin, the, the ridership numbers drop off enough where the, the investment it just doesn't justify the investment. So I think one of the, that's a very good question, and one of the things that I learned through this is through this analysis, this corridor analysis, and what TriMet's been doing in the West Side Corridor study, what they found is there is enough demand for a second bus line from Sherwood mm -hmm. to points elsewhere in Washington County. So that's another outcome. No, we don't have to wait for the bus rapid transit and light rail investments, but rather there is demand there for some increased bus service now. And that's another good local outcome too. 
Any other questions? This gentleman here's had his hand up for a while. Oh, great. A, a, a couple of questions. A couple of questions. Uh, one, you talked about all these grants and so forth. Is it federal, state, county? Where does this money come from? That's right. So uh, different dollars come from different resources. Uh, for example, the regional travel options dollars, those dollars come through monies through the federal government. Uh, as well as through the state for programs that refer to um, uh, congestion uh, mitigation and air quality uh, re uh, improvements. So the federal government wants to see that there is support for transportation means other than just driving. So they want to see that there are better sidewalks that get you to the places you might want to go better sidewalks from transit to where people live or work, uh, better bicycling facilities, things like that. The Nature and Neighborhoods Restoration and Enhancement Grants, those dollars uh, have been coming out of the Metro General Funds that we've been dedicating, uh, just as we were investing general <coughs> fund dollars for caring for parks and regional areas, uh, regional parks and natural areas. But as we said during the scope of the levy, we've got too many pressures on dollars for that. We're falling behind, so we went to the public with the local option uh, tax. It was approved, and part of that proposal was because of the demand for these dollars, increasing the availability of them. So different programs have different sources. The community, the community development grants that Council Harrington mentioned that we just we just put out. That money comes from an excise tax that's actually charged to developers. When developers do development, they pay have to pay a fee that goes into that fund, which then can be used by communities to do future uh, planning about where do, how, where, do, where should streets go, how do you do sewers, where do you put water service, that kind of thing. Question two, um, which was a question from a neighbor or a friend or somebody I can't remember who asked Captain Harrington, why is why is Metro buying up all the watershed property they get their hands on? I don't know if that's true, false, or what. But if that's true, why are you? <laughs> uh, I don't believe we're buying every watershed uh, property we can. The voters approved a proposal through the bond, Natural Areas Bond Program in 2006. There were identified 27 different areas that had been recommended to the voters based upon scientific analysis and needs. What do we need to do to protect water quality for our population as well as for fish and wildlife? Uh, and uh, also natural habitat for those same associated reasons. So they, a lot of scientific analysis was done. There were 27 different areas throughout our three county area, some in urban areas and some in the rural areas. For example, Chehalem Ridge, which is not far from here, is surrounded by the Tualatin River on three sides and has 28 different streams, six, of which, six or eight which are year-round streams into the Tualatin River. So by improving the, the drainage in that area, we're um, reducing the temperature, which is a big concern here for us in Washington County with the Tualatin River. So it's not everywhere we can get our hands on. It's voter approved 27 different areas. The, the motive behind it is, is purchasing uh, uh, headwater, uh, uh, watershed headwaters for uh, environmental reasons. They're, they're sensitive areas to improve and protect water quality. And I'm a little remiss in not, uh, I should also suggest there's information that's publicly available to all of you with details on this. On the Metro website, oregonmetro.gov, if you search natural areas, you'll get information on the Natural Areas Bond Program. And there are annual reports that the Citizen Oversight Committee has done that report back to you Compared to what you approved in 2006, what is the progress to date? So about half of the 
dollars have been spent thus far, and uh, almost all of the local share dollars that were provided to local cities, counties, and park providers, they have utilized. Uh, and then with the third aspect of the bond measure, the capital grants program, over half of those dollars have been uh, taken care of as well. All this information you can find on the Metro website, but if you have any difficulty in finding it, once again, don't hesitate to contact me or Councilor Dukes. Yes, sir, and then we'll make sure we get you. Who owns the property now that is being purchased? The public. Metro on your behalf. Okay, but no, um, who owned it before you bought it? Oh, a whole variety, generally private property owners. It's a willing seller program, so we only buy property that the owners are willing to sell. Uh, some of the <coughs> opportunities are, are pretty interesting and overwhelming in a way. For example, Stimson Lumber with the Chehalem Ridge property, 1,100 acres. We never imagined that we would get such a large intact holding on the top of that area. Um, but it was within the target area, and wow, you know, that was wonderful. Some of the purchases uh, we tried to make more publicly accessible. Uh, and so, for example, with the levy you just passed in May, Chehalem Ridge has a great uh, network of logging roads. We've offered some tours in the summertime to the public. But with this levy, we hope to put signage up so you can go and safely walk on them any time. We have to stabilize a couple of culverts, but then there will be signage, so you don't have to worry about getting lost. There's another property up on Skyline Boulevard that was purchased through Hampton Lumber, and it too has a nice logging road around it, but is missing signage. So for me, I've gone on the public tours because <coughs> I'm a little leery of taking roads I'm not sure of, uh, but we're gonna put signage up there as well, so it'll be publicly available to you. But these properties are properties that the private landowners have wanted to, are open to selling <coughs> and they're willing to sell. And um, uh, market assessment is done. Uh, so the price, the purchase price is based upon the market price. So we have a watershed property. Is there going to be hiking on it? Is there biking on it? Is it going to be accessible? Well, and the answer is it depends. It depends upon the critical habitat that a property provides. Uh, is it appropriate for public access? And do we have the funds to build it out for safe public access? So, uh, for example, there is a property, a uh, set of properties that Metro has purchased right at Rude Bridge, uh, not Rude Bridge, Philip Harris Bridge, right there on River Road at Farmington. And we would love to develop that oh, yeah. as a park with a water access to the Twelton River. And I've been here to tell you about the master planning effort for that. Uh, that is completed, and this spring we submitted an application to the State Parks Program to try and secure the dollars to build that out. We didn't get that grant this time. We'll apply in future years. So now it's we're just waiting to have the money to build it out as a park available to you. One of, one of my goals when I ran for Metro Council was because I wanted to have uh, some influence in that area and make sure that uh, properties that were brought into public ownership where they make sense, where they add value for public recreation, that there is public access, and that we can provide the kind of infrastructure there for things like for parking and restrooms and so forth, so that they can be used by the public without degrading the, degrading it, you know, people parking out in the, tr in the grass and not having restroom facilities, that kind of thing. So that's a goal of mine, is to make sure that we get that public access to those. Yeah. And we've been trying. We have more properties that we want to make publicly available, but for having the monetary resources to do that. So we're there, we want to. Yes, sir. <coughs> this goes back to that trail that you were talking about. 
Fields Grove West. The Council Creek master planning effort. Uh, I know you have no jurisdiction out of Washington County, and you mentioned it would be going up to banks in that area. Now, uh, is there any discussion or thought that somebody will pick it up and take it all the way to the beach? Yes, that is part of the vision. The county particularly is interested in that, and I can't remember the name. There's a project name for that. Uh, but the way projects like this go is, first we have to have a vision, and a master plan helps uh, capture what that vision is. And then once we have that vision documented, then we can pursue uh, various funding ap avenues to build that vision. Uh, and so that's what we were just talking about, having the monies to build out different facilities. So our first step is to capture the vision, and we don't have that yet. One of our jobs is to find ways to form partnerships with other jurisdictions who, who do have the jurisdiction over those kinds of areas and work together with them so we can have a a shared vision that we can link together. A good example of that is uh, like the Fano Creek Trail that runs from the Tualatin River north and will eventually go all the way from the city of Tualatin through Tigard, through Beaverton, through West Portland and all the way to the Willamette River. And it, and it requires coordination and agreement and between all those different jurisdictions to make it happen. And that's one of the places where Metro as a regional government works very well because we can be a convener to bring all those different people together to work together. Is that the, uh, the specific trail you're talking about now, is that the one that uh, follows the uh, power lines? That's the West Side Trail. That'll kind of parallel it and be linked to it in several places, but that, that's a different trail it's system different plan. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so if you have any further questions about the what some of the different trails are, don't hesitate to contact us and we can point you to some other map. Resources. Well, I, I don't, but I was just kind of wondering uh, if there was any fore, forethought already to take it all the way to the beach, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. uh, would That's that good. be a, yeah. a place for the uh, Hoochie Coast rally people? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good thinking. Yes, sir. I think uh, Eric probably wants to wrap this up pretty quickly, so I'll, I'll keep my uh, questions short. I'm on the Tolton Hills Park and Rec District Bond Oversight Committee, and um, a few years ago we looked at one of Metro's reports to get an idea of how they did theirs, and we kind of found it lacking, um, and you're probably familiar with what our reports look like. So I would just encourage Metro, and we haven't looked at them in the last couple of years, so they may have gotten better. Just well, they're in they're developed entirely by the Citizen Oversight <laughs> Committee, so it's not developed by Metro. I, I understand that. Yeah, I, I understand that. I, I would uh, I would encourage Metro from the top down to encourage their citizens to maybe perhaps expand their reports. Um, they could take a look at ours. Uh, perhaps you could get our chairman to uh, volunteer to help out with that. Um, but I think that it would be good from Metro's perspective get more information out in a way that the public can really look at and see that there's a lot of good being done by the levies because I know that there's a lot of opposition uh, to the levies and if you can show some concrete statistics and things like that, it would benefit both you and it would placate some of the opponents. So. We'll, we'll be sure to pass that on. Thank well, you. It's a good point too because the one thing we've learned particularly in this area is that the, the, the better we inform people, the less opposition there is. The more they know about it, the better they like it. We did, the committee and the Metro Auditor did um, uh, ask us to ensure that we were more actively reporting back to the public. So you might remember uh, summer of 2000 and, not, this was 13, so summer of 2012, there was a big program through farmers markets and other community events through the spring and summer called It's Our Nature. Uh, so there were booths uh, for people to get information, ask questions. Uh, there were videos on available on our website and so forth. So we're trying different techniques, but it work, it's work that's never done. And I appreciate the suggestion and we'll, we'll be sure to pass it on. 
I just wanted to ask in terms of capturing vision, as you mentioned, that you will be going through that process. What sort of, you know, intentional, are there requirements in the grant that really intentionally reach out to communities, especially underserved communities, that are usually most affected by these changes? Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, Carla and I work for Center for Intercultural Organizing, mm -hmm. and we do a lot of work with immigrants and refugees and mm -hmm. people of color. Yep. Yeah, so we have a new program in place to develop a, a metro agency specific equity strategy and we have a whole equity strategy advisory committee. Uh, we had, boy, over 35 people apply for that committee. So uh, Jose Rivera, for example, from Centro Cultural is involved with that and other names and organizations that you're familiar with through your work. So we're trying to do a better job. We need to keep working at it. Uh, it's one reason why, for example, with the regional flexible fund grants that we, we just finished the public uh, comment period for that. Uh, we made sure that we there were additional outreach efforts uh, throughout the region, including here in Washington County, and Metro provided resources to each of the three counties to help make this easier, uh, translation services and whatnot. It's a start. It's getting better. It's not where we ultimately need to be. We're working at it. We appreciate uh, the additional communication, advice, and interest to help us get better. Because after all, government is here to serve everyone in our community. Thank you. Um, let's uh, wrap, um, you got two questions over there. Gentlemen, let's keep them super brief and then I'll close with a quick one at the end. Bob, you first on the corner. Okay, who and when are they gonna decide what they're gonna do with the Westgate property? So the Westgate property is in joint ownership between Metro and the city of Beaverton. Uh, we continue to uh, entertain different applications at different times. Uh, there are some things that are underway uh, right How now. About the medical building, basically, what they want to do with that. Well, that is the city of Beaverton's current approach. Uh, no matter what uh, uh, sort of final uh, thoughts are on that, there will need to be a review in order to make sure that it satisfies the. Uh, Federal Transit Authority uh, requirements for this purchase since the dollars came through the federal program and FTA. Uh, because the, per the reason for purchasing that site, as we have also done with the property that is now known as Fourth Main in, in downtown Hillsboro, that's a mixed use development, it's all about getting uh, more uh, housing, employment, and other amenities in the community to take advantage of the light rail investments that have been made. It's called transit-oriented development. So there's some additional work to be done to see if these latest proposals make sense for the community and meet the criteria. So you're right about what the current thinking is. There's more work to be done. Steve, super quick. I'm wondering if you would entertain a question about transportation funding prioritization for mitigation for urban growth boundary amendment, I guess. Ooh, that <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Spit it out, make it okay. quick. Um, not aware of any, and was hoping that maybe you could um, advocate on our behalf for prioritization of regional funding for mitigation efforts for South Hillsborough and South Beaverton for uh, impacts into a lower refill, um, considering that Metro, um, through the RTP initially, made TV Highway a freeway that made South Hillsboro look like it had access, and now Metro made TV Highway look more like a small road, but not changing it from a principal arterial to an arterial, and, and so that that meant that Hillsboro had to plan moving its east-west traffic through our streets instead of the principal arterial. And there's, you know, so now the big argument is between Hillsborough and the county, whose responsibility is it? And I'm just wondering if there's any regional prioritization for that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's, that, I, I kind of watched that from afar because I was on the other side of the line at the time. 
and it looked like there was part of the challenge there was because of the difference in vision between the city of Hillsborough and Washington County and the city of Beaverton on what how they pictured TV Highway and what they ultimately wanted to be. So what finally came out of that was sort of a compromise. Am I am all, am all correct there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when we look at those kinds of areas, and one of the ways that the planning takes place is with those funds that I was talking about that was from the excise tax from developers that will help come up with plans for how to create the right kind of transportation system for those kinds of areas. Once that planning has been done and we start looking at uh, dollars to actually implement those plans, one of the requirements for a criteria to qualify for that kind of money is how well does it support the corridor and the center. So the fact that South Hillsboro and South Beaverton, or well, South Hillsboro in particular, is a center that puts it higher on the list for priority to get those kinds of funds. So that, that helps. That would be funding for TV Highway, whereas I'm asking about they're shunting highway traffic, in essence, onto east-west streets in Aloha and Reedville mm -hmm. that aren't really even anything but old country roads. And well, you're, you're right to point out that we have a lot of roads throughout our county, including in the Aloha area that we're behind on in terms of improving compared to the demand. It's one reason why we voters of Washington County approved the Major Streets Transportation Improvement Program back in 1995 for, for the third round, MISTIP 3. You know, that's over 15 years ago now, but those dollars are very important to us. Unfortunately, that hasn't kept up with the demand. So. Uh, we've just got to keep working on the problem and we continue to work in partnership with Washington County as well as with the cities as well as with the state to try and bring as many resources as possible to bear to the incredible demand that exists. Not an easy problem. Yeah, is there a prioritization? I'm going to cut you off. I'll work on, I just got to keep the meeting moving along. What I'd like to do is um, actually close with a, a quick comment, uh, concern, and question. Uh, the comment that I've got is, or excuse me, the request that I've got is one that um, I made of Councillor Dirksen on his uh, May appearance here. I'd like to ask again that um, if and when it becomes available, um, we as a group would like access to the Metro model. Uh, we'd like to be able to play with it, and we think it's software that we own, and since it doesn't account for accidents, for example, and, but it's something that we use, or I mean, we're held accountable for. The metro model, for the benefit of the group, is the transportation model for the region. And we'd like to be able to play with the numbers because we think we have a vested interest. Whether or not we might be able to be smart enough to operate it, don't know. Um, just, I made my request. The concern that I share is specific, and that is to a vendor that I'm seeing with citizen involvement, JLA public involvement. I'm calling them on the carpet. I am perturbed and concerned that they are far too involved and not meeting the mark. And since public money is being spent for this vendor, um, I've been on the record communicating with um, uh, counties and cities that this vendor, um, for citizen involvement, has missed the mark. And, one, um, uh, and I would avail myself to the opportunity to help Metro negotiate their next contract with this vendor by presenting my arguments face to face with Metro staff and this vendor. Um, but what I'd like to do is hopefully end the meeting on a happy note and opt in and West Side Voices are ways that we connect with Metro. And I'm wondering if you could close uh, uh, with uh, comments about connecting with Metro and part of the citizen involvement process. What's going on with opt in and tell me about the partnership with West Side Voices. Well, a couple of things there. Eric did mention two of the resources for connecting with Metro and your Metro counselors. It's very important to us that we hear from you in the community because we work for you. So that's one reason why we come to meetings like this face to face. But in addition, don't hesitate to call us. Send us email. Uh, also, we have newsletters and news feeds. It's one reason why we each have our business cards tonight to make it easy for you. All you have to do is send us an email that says sign me up and we'll get that done for you. 
Uh, you can also go to the Metro website, oregonmetro.gov slash connect, and you'll see the list of different news feeds and newsletters you can sign up for. So not just our council information, but also Green Scene, for example, uh, you can sign up for electronically. So there are many different ways to connect. Uh, Opt-in and West Side Voices is built on opt-in. There are these surveys. We'd love for you to participate. I know Washington County is using West Side Voices very well. We've made all of these survey results publicly available. We as Metro Counselors get that very same information. We don't get special information uh, that you don't see. So all of the surveys are available right there for you at optinpanel.org. You've got complete access to it. Uh, so please take advantage of that. But once again, don't hesitate to call us. We're real people. Don't hesitate to email us. Don't hesitate to show up at our meetings. Uh, send us letters. People do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. So why not yeah. you? Why not you? Catherine, what CPO do you want? Pardon me? What CPO district do you want? Well, I have uh, five CPOs in my district. I live in CPO 7, yeah. where, which is where I've lived for 23 years now. First in Bethany and now for the last five years in Beaverton. Can you, Eric, can they update their districts? Because we now have two Metro Councilors in CPO uh, 6. Yes, and I brought a map, for those of you who aren't familiar with, with the, the um, Census information, the district lines, had to be adjusted to, in order for us to comply with federal law. So the District 4 line is essentially from the county line to the east, Multnomah County, Washington County line, Beaverton Hillsdale Highway, and then to TV Highway until we get to the westerly edge. Can you tell I'm directionally challenged? the western edge of South Hillsboro, and then my district dips down for the rest of Hillsboro, Cornelius, and Forest Grove. So anything south of that in Washington County, Which District so 3. So where we are now is actually yeah. in my district. But we're <coughs> elected by the voters in districts to make regional decisions. So we're not making decisions just for our district, okay? But we do have to make sure that we have a system so that district voters can hold us accountable, and you do that through your vote. The, the, the district lines get changed to maintain parity, population parity. Uh, this last election, my district lost a big chunk of Clackamas County that went to Carletta Collette's district because the population of Washington County had grown so much that to have the same si size of population I now have a smaller geographic space than I had before. Me too. I think that's a good time to ask for some applause. <laughs> Thank you both very much for being here. I really appreciate it. I'm going to buy Cindy Dower uh, a minute or two to come up here. And what I'd like to do is just give you a quick update. A couple of you know I was elected uh, president of the Washington County Public Affairs Forum, and that's going to be ramping up now at the Pepper Mill starting on Monday. And I have a uh, chair of the Washington County Commissioners, Andy Dyke, presenting. And then we're going to have a parade typically of statewide electeds. However, I do have a neat sustainable energy program on wave energy coming up, I think, late September. WashingtonCountyForum.org is uh, the place. And I'm going to brag for a second because we took video promote our video production in-house, and we just cut our membership fees by 10 bucks, which I think is uh, a hallmark of the work that uh, John Tyner and I did behind the scenes to um, revamp the organization. So I'm really looking forward to launching with uh, some fresh energy. And speaking of fresh energy, we've got Cindy Dower uh, from the Website Cultural Alliance. And uh, are you ready to take it away? I am. I am. My slide's been up there <laughs> all meeting. Then we're going to get you started. Oh, and, and I'm standing in the way. I'm going to stand on the stand side. there. Sure. All right. How do I get the bar at the bottom of the way? Um, let's... There you go. Voila. Cool. All right. Well, before I get started telling you about the Westside Cultural Alliance, I was going to give you guys sort of a little arts and culture in Washington County quiz. 
So I wanted to know if any of you recognized what signature event in Washington County this photo was taken at. This one was actually taken in 2012, but it's a signature event held every June. Anybody? Yeah. Is it 10 tiny dances? It is. It's 10 tiny dances in downtown Beaverton where they take these two feet, but you can't really see the stage in this picture, but they're two feet by two feet and they're elevated uh, and they get dancers that represent cultures from around the world, but also contemporary dancers. And they nestle these stages in downtown Beaverton and you walk around during the farmer's market and you get to see the, the dances. So this is definitely one of Washington County's sort of annual signature events um, of arts and culture. What about, I was wondering if anyone could tell me what two professional theater companies are located in Washington County? Bag and Baggage and Broadway Road. That's right, yes, Bag and Baggage uh, Productions, which is based at the Venetian in downtown Hillsboro, and then Broadway Rose Theater Company, which is based in Tiger. Um, uh, they're both professional theater companies uh, and do outstanding work. My final question was, do any of you know what art gallery in Washington County is celebrating its 50th anniversary this month? 50 years this art gallery has been in Washington County. It is. It's the Village Gallery of the Arts um, in uh, the yeah, well, no, 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 sorry, not the Val Valley Art Gallery. Oh. It's the Village Gallery of the Arts, um, right up there in Cedar Mill. It's right next to the Cedar Mill Library, and they're celebrating 50 years this month. No yeah, so next time you're in Cedar Mill, uh, if you're out near the library, check out the, the gallery there. So a little bit about the Westside Cultural Alliance, which I represent. Uh, the Alliance was formed in 1999 when Washington County was creating a cultural plan. Uh, we were bringing together stakeholders from around the county in um, arts and culture to give feedback and um, ideas for the plan. Uh, then in 2004, we became a 501c3 a charitable organization. Uh, we didn't have funding for a long time, and then I believe, and I've been with the organization for about a year, so I'm still digging through some of the history, which is stored in a nice box in my <laughs> office right now. Um, but we're primarily funded by the Regional Arts and Culture Council, which um, the Regional Arts and Culture Council, or RAC, gets funding from Washington County, Multnomah County, Clackamas County, as well as the city of Portland, and private sources. And Metro, thank you. <laughs> and we get about $12,000 a year uh, in direct allocation from RAC for staff time. We have one part-time staffer, that's me. <laughs> and we're run by an all-volunteer board. One thing that we really try to keep in mind at the Westside Cultural Alliance is this county-wide perspective. Um, so in Washington County in the last 10 years, there have been incredible developments in arts and culture. There are now four public arts commissions in Washington County, Forest Grove, Hillsboro, Beaverton, and Sherwood, all have citizen panels representing arts and culture and giving feedback to those cities. Um, but one thing that we found is we call them silos. We've been talking about silos of arts and culture. And there isn't a lot of communication between these groups. So one of our goals is to keep that county-wide perspective and to increase collaboration between organizations that are out there in different areas. I included our current board members to give you an idea of who is spearheading this organization. We have Christina Caravaca, who is the cultural program supervisor for the city of Hillsboro. So she oversees the Walters Cultural Arts Center. Um, the Hillsborough Arts and Culture Council, anything having to do with arts and culture in Hillsborough, Christina is pretty much in charge. Sharon Maroney is the founder and artistic director at Broadway Rose Theater Company. Liz Patch is from Sherwood and she's an active volunteer. She's with uh, Rotary and also uh, volunteers with the Broadway Rose. Sue Pike may be a familiar name to some of you. She's a longtime 
a resident of this area and is very active in the Beaverton Chamber, uh, as well as with the Icing Choir, which is a fantastic group based in Beaverton. Laura Rollins is our current chair, and <clears throat> Laura is a choreographer. Uh, she also helped found Funny Farm Early Learning Center, which is in Garden Home. Mm. Another familiar name might be John Schrag. He's the publisher of the Forest Grove News Times and the Hillsboro Tribune. He also publishes the quarterly Washington County Arts Guide, which just recently came out. Uh, we also have Janie Scott, who is the cultural program manager at the city of Beaverton and about, involved with the Beaverton Arts Commission. And finally, the amazing oh. Eric Squire, <laughs> who of course helped found the Aloha Library. He's working on the Aloha Historical Society, Public Affairs Forum, and CPO6. So we're very lucky to have Eric. Here um, are some of our goals that we're working on currently at the Westside Cultural Alliance. We have just launched, or we're launching this month, um, arts and culture networking events for Washington County. So again, we're working on that, go that goal of increasing collaboration between existing organizations and breaking down those silos. Um, so actually, I have a hand up for that, so I'll pass <coughs> these around. We're calling it Eat, Drink, Art West, which actually our board member in the room helped come up with. Um, so you can take a look at those. We'll be rotating our networking events around the county. Uh, the first one will be at the Golden Valley Brewery off of Bethany Boulevard in Cornell right there. Another one of our goals is visibility and awareness for arts and culture in Washington County. So we do this in a couple different ways. We have a website, westsidculturalalliance.org, on which we pretty much have an index of almost every arts and culture organization and event in Washington County. Um, so if you're looking for something, an event that you remember, or an organization, um, you can easily search our website and find that. We're also on social media and now helping to spread the word about exciting events in fact, I just posted on Facebook today a reminder about the annual, the 23rd annual Chalk Art Festival happening in Forest Grove later this month. Uh, the Washington County Cultural Plan, which I mentioned earlier, um, the current revision of it expires in 2015, which will be something that we will be active in seeking feedback and helping get stakeholders to submit their um, ideas and opinions for. Uh, finally, I come to public and private support for the arts, which, of course, comes down to funding. That's what we're talking about, funding for the arts. Uh, if you ask any arts and culture organization in Washington County what their number one need is, and it's funding. There are several groups right now um, running campaigns that are raising private support for the arts. RAC, the Regional Arts and Culture Council, does a program called Work for Arts and they partner with um, businesses to allow employees to make charitable contributions through payroll deductions. So you get to decide how much you wanna donate, to what group you wanna donate, and the frequency of those donations. There are several companies in Washington County that do work for art, Intel, Pacific University, City of Beaverton, Burgerville, and Washington County. Another kind of interesting um, campaign raising public, or excuse me, private support for the arts, which I thought would interest you guys. Um, the Hillsborough Arts and Culture Council just created the Arts and Culture Endowment. So it's a legacy giving campaign. Um, and so they're creating this fund that will support programming uh, and organizations that service Hillsborough for years to come. When we're talking about public support for the arts, we usually make two arguments in favor of why we should have public support or public funding for the arts. The first one is livability. So when we're talking about creating livable communities, one of the factors in a livable community is access to the arts. Um, so, yes, so access to the arts. The other one is, um, economic vitality, or, thank you, Oops. or economic prosperity. So 
They did this study, Americans for the Arts, uh, in 2012, and I thought I would just share some of the findings with you because it's pretty interesting to see the tie between um, economic prosperity um, and the arts. You can see it was called uh, Arts and Economic Prosperity 4, and they're looking at the economic impact of nonprofit arts and culture organizations and their audiences. So this is where it's going to show us how arts and culture can affect Washington County. So this was a national study that they did. They looked at 182 communities and regions, including several multi-city and multi-county regions. They looked at the greater Portland area. Um, and they represented all 50 states in their study. And I took their graphic from uh, their study, but I think it, it projected better than I thought it would, so that's great. So you can see there's two different um, things they're looking at here. They're looking at the economic impact of the organizations and then the economic impact of the audiences. And you can see in direct expenditures, which is the top line there, um, across the nation in 2012, arts and culture organizations spent $61 billion. And that includes payroll, that includes facilities, that includes insurance, that includes paying their performers. Audiences that attended arts and culture events in 2012 spent $74 billion. What do you think <laughs> someone who's going to an arts and culture event spends money on? Parking. Art. Alcohol. Alcohol. And wine. Yes, and alcohol. it's mostly food and beverages. Um, but you can also see um, that they also generate arts and culture organizations, a lot of revenue for local, state, and federal governments. This one's a little smaller, but hopefully you can see this. So um, this yellow part over here represents the food industry. So the restaurant industry and the arts go well together. Um, also, audiences that went to a performance spent money on transportation, Souvenirs, clothing, and lodging as well. So just looking at the Portland metro area, um, so this was a study of the three counties in our region in 2012, it was a $250 million industry that created or supported 8,500 full-time equivalent jobs in our area and generated 21 million in local and state government revenue. You can also see, um, this is similar to the chart we looked at earlier, um, the breakdown of how audiences spent their money when they went to an arts and culture event. And again, you know, just like the national trend, the meals before and after the event were the biggest uh, expenditure. Another thing that's been on the Westside Cultural Alliance radar and will probably come back as a major goal in the near future, um, you can tell the difference in spending between residents versus non-residents, so cultural tourism is a huge industry and it generates a lot of money locally for our economy. Um, so that's something, again, we've studied in the past and I'm certain will come back soon. So here was the conclusion from all that studying and um, data that they gathered. By demonstrating that investing in the arts and culture yields economic benefits, Arts and Economic Prosperity 4 lays to rest a common misconception that communities support the arts and culture at the expense of local economic development. In fact, communities are investing in an industry that supports jobs, generates government revenue, and is a cornerstone of tourism. The arts mean business. So again, when we're advocating for public support for the arts, we're talking about, yes, the arts do generate um, revenue for our local economy, and they do support small businesses and revitalize our communities, and we're trying to, again, create livable communities. So those are our two arguments in favor of public support for the arts. So I also wanted to include, just to kind of wrap things up, some ideas for you guys on how you can get involved in local arts and culture. So I put up some events that are happening near us, where we are now. 
Um, Bag and Baggage Productions is doing uh, The Great Gatsby in downtown Hillsboro starting September 26th. They love to do the classics with a twist, so there will no doubt be some surprise in there. Uh, Painter Showcase will be happening at the Reserve uh, in Aloha that same weekend, September 27th and 28th. Uh, then the annual tour of historic homes in Forest Grove is happening this month as well. That's a large fundraiser for the Friends of Historic Forest Grove. There are, I believe, eight houses on their tour this year, including the 1854 A.T. Smith House. Very cool stuff. And finally, Washington County Open Studios is happening October 19th and 20th. And that is all over the county. And artists open up their studios. Uh, and it's free. You get to drop in. You can go to your neighbor's studio. Or you can travel all over the county and see artists at work in their environment. So just some cool opportunities for you to check out. My Email address doesn't show up very well there, I apologize, but I have some contact information as well. Um, but definitely check us out online, westsideculturalalliance.org. We want to help promote your events. We want to help bring visibility to what you guys are doing in your community with arts and culture, whether it's a book sale at the library or a play down the street. Um, we want to know about it, and then we can help connect people with your organization as well. Questions, folks? Ah, yes. Um, I see on your card the uh, Cultural Coalition of Washington County gave you some money. Can yes. you talk about that organization? I can, absolutely. Um, so the Cultural Coalition of Washington County receives money from the Oregon Cultural Trust. Some of you may have heard of the tax credit that is actually that was renewed this year, um, which is pretty exciting. So if you can give a charitable contribution to your organization of choice, you can give a matching donation to the trust, and you get a tax credit for that donation. Um, and so the Cultural Coalition, I believe, gave out around $40,000 this yep. year um, in grants to local organizations. And so we did receive one of those grants. And um, they're actually opening up their next grant cycle yes, now. <laughs> yeah. So there's a new grant cycle out there currently. And they fund all kinds of amazing programs locally, um, everything from theater to fine art um, to photography to arts awareness. So Anthony, um, you, you are on that board, as are you. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> and what boards are you not on? <laughs> this one. <laughs> <laughs> you can be recruited. It's Next true. question. There's another question out there. Lyles? I had one. Um, you mentioned when you, when you, one of your first questions is what theater production companies we had in the area. At least I think I understood that. I've been to plays in Hillsborough with the HART group. Is yes. That, is that number three or is that not a well, production company? Well, what I said was um, professional theater. So I there are an additional community theater groups there. Is Theater in the Grove, which has been around for over 50 yes. years. Um, there's HART, the Hillsborough Artists Regional Theater. There is the Beaverton Civic Theater. Um, there's also in Tigert a fairly new group, Mask and Mirror Theater Company. And then um, Sherwood also has a, the Sherwood Performing Arts, which they do mostly um, theater for children. But those are like non-professional, or everybody that's in the show community is not paid. They're, yeah, they're community. Yes, community theater, okay. yeah. Thanks. I should have made that distinction, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I really want to commend Cindy because uh, I've had the chance to work with her and at the last um, um, Westside Economic Alliance, excuse me, Westside Cultural Alliance meeting, they voted me on the board and I had to attend a couple. And, um, uh, Cindy is also uh, kind of famous for producing a magazine. And I'm wondering if you would, yeah, I know that's kind of old news, but um, one of the things that Cindy did was um, uh, produce uh, the Washington County Review, and that was uh, really remarkable um, because she just organically produced that, and you're uh, just doing an amazing job with uh, 
WCA. I think that's just uh, awesome. And so uh, thank you for being here. Yes, and, uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Um, beautiful. Well, um, as you and everybody else should be aware, there's still snacks back there. I tried to pawn off the last of the cookies in the last round. But uh, um, what I want to do is segue over to Steve Lawrence, who's got some time uh, to discuss the, um, uh, you can go till uh, five up, and then uh, Wallace Garcia's got land use applications. And I want to end promptly and promise, or fulfill the promise of ending on time at nine. So uh, does that give you enough time? Um, then before Steve gets to speak, I want to um, remind all of you that Steve is our, uh, has served in many capacities uh, uh, with CPO6, not only as chair, but uh, really had some success with uh, um, uh, building just some amazing stuff in the past as chair with um, our access management plan of TV Highway, which is legendary. Uh, but Steve has uh, re most recently served us in the capacity of as an advisor and an advocate for keeping South Hillsboro focused and making sure Aloha's needs are met. With that being said, do you want to uh, tell us about the uh, Planning Commission meeting and or anything else you got to say about South Hillsboro and um, and our traffic issues. Take it away, Steve. Thank you. Um, since I was since our last meeting, um, there have been two planning commission meetings, or actually hearings, public hearings. Probably the only public hearing Hillsborough is going to have on the transportation plan. Um, I received uh, the staff report for South Hillsborough um, about uh, 36 hours or so before the hearing, and um, a lot of material. Some of which was stuff we've been dealing with for a while and some wasn't. Um, so what we've been trying to do, as Eric mentioned over the years, um, this has been going on for 15 years, the South Hillsborough process, and um, is to get Hillsborough to realize that there are going to be impacts to the adjacent community. And um, within the last, I don't know, Mike and I were talking about this the, the other day at a morning meeting, uh, the last three months or so maybe, Hillsborough has acknowledged that there are going to be impacts of placing 30,000 plus people across the street. And um, so we made some headway. Took a while. Um, actually, even at the very last hearing, there was new staff revelations about um, the impacts. And uh, one, like I was asking the Metro Councilors whether or not we could ask them to be our advocates because being an unincorporated area like this, uh, we don't have the advocacy group that, that the city has to, to reach out for funding and to exert force on other entities. Um, we do have our county commissioners, and they've been an advocate for us in this process. But Okay, so anyhow, um, I didn't have time to talk to you about my testimony presentation, but it pretty much has moved along the lines that we've discussed in the past, the impacts, who's going to pay for the impacts, and what it does to our livability to change our local roads that we can back out of our driveways in on now, changing them into arterial streets that have, in essence, 600-foot spacing requirements for intersections and no driveways. Um, and it's not something that's easy to get the city to think about it. Uh, in fact, the, that was one of the things that they just realized that the last, very last hearing after the hearing uh, was, oh yeah, you're right. You know, Kinnaman Road is going to meet arterial traffic. By any definition, the traffic that they're going to be shunting onto Kinnaman is going to be arterial traffic either because it meets 10,000 vehicles a day or and because it's not local traffic. It's traffic that some of which is choosing to now use Kinnaman Road to go move south and east, as because TV Highway is full at many times of the day. So, also uh, Farmington. Yeah, and all, well, Farmington's full, of course, we know that. So, um, <laughs> but we've made, I, what I'm trying to say is that we've made some headway. That's the good news. The bad news is that one of the things I was hoping to persuade them to do was to put this off for another year and a half or so until the outcome, or at least the likely outcomes, may be known of a you probably read about it in the newspaper. The state is apparently going to give a million and a half dollars for a west side solution. So in other words, looking at moving traffic along the western edge of the Urban Grove Boundary. I think it would have been a good idea to do that before they allow Urban Grove Boundary amendments along the west side because I see that the Urban Grove Boundary amendments ought to be the places where you locate some of these kind of facilities. 
which is one of the things you may have read in the newspaper, it made it appear that I was advocating for a freeway over here on, and the Colonial Pass alignment. What I really was advocating for was wait and see what the study would say for whether or not the design that they have for Canadian Pass running through uh, South Hillsboro, which is a Main Street kind of uh, arterial, is really appropriate. Is can you move enough through traffic through there? And maybe it may be more appropriate to have a more of a Murray Road type facility that's got a little more access management along it and has, therefore, a, a little more through carrying capacity and possibly uh, more right away for. Uh, set away corridors for, for mass transit. So that's what I was saying, but you know, it's more sexy to say I was advocating for freeway, so that's what was written in the paper. These guys know all about that. Hey, so <laughs> I jump in with kind of a question. Yeah. With focus, um, the testimony of the, the Hillsborough Planning Commission that I attended, we had um, a CPO 10 provide testimony that the Corn Pass punch through didn't go to Clark Hill Road. Our CPO also suggested that Cornelius Pass just dead ended at uh, not Briggs but uh, Rosedale. Uh, Rosedale. 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 And it seemed the, uh, the the concern was is that uh, the plan didn't think forward to have north south capacity. Um, and I guess that's a yes or no question. Did you sense that as well? Well, I mean it, that's a really political question, as you know, because it gets into the urban reserves issues and a lot of other of other things. Okay. You know. Well, then. Um, then skip that. Here's another question. I found I, hang on, hang on. Oh. on that area south of Rosedale Road mm -hmm. is undesignated yeah. and not rural reserve. So right. should that should urban and rural reserves ever get through all of the court appeals and those designations mm -hmm. stand, the county and the state would then be able to pursue potential solutions. Very good point. TV Highway has been limited in terms of number of lanes, potentially maybe getting a bat lane, yet the right of what, so limited to five lanes, a TV Highway, yet the Corn Pass extension that does not go through South Hillsboro has right of way for seven lanes. No, that's a mistake. That, okay. was, a, that was one of these things that, that uh, sounded good in the newspaper, but wasn't what was said. Okay, what was what said? What was said was they are reserving the seven lane right of way for as far south as Alexander Street south of TV Highway, which you know is one block. Alexander Street is what they call Blanton Street in Hillsborough, even though there's an Alexander Street in the lower that's on the other side of the highway. Okay. <laughs> so, but, so that's only one block. It's only one long block south of uh, there. So it's really a five lane. Oh, so that, it's really intersection um, it's, lane. Well, it is that mostly. It is, a, yeah, it's, there's a lot of turning lanes and those kinds of things, and it's the area between the first intersection and the TV Highway intersection that, that Don was talking about. And, and you're right, that was a confusing point, and I think even some of the Planning Commission members thought he said it was reserved the whole way through, but it wasn't. That's not what he said. Okay. And um, good point, though. Um, so that, that in, in, incidentally, goes by schools, it goes through a town center, it has calling on it, it has all the things. So in essence, 209, that's why we've always, I mean, 209 for many, many years was, was designated as a five lane road. And it wasn't until fairly recently that the county changed it over to a three lane road. And now it, it's been going to be redesignated as a five lane road because it's pretty obvious that that's where the through traffic will be for at least for the foreseeable future. I mean, let's face it, it's gonna take a lot of dump trucks to build what's happening over there. and. And Cornelius Pass only, even at its best, only will extend as far south as Rosedale for the foreseeable future, let's just say. So, at um, any rate, uh, that's one more thing we want, though, is that, you know, not that I like having big roads, but it, it pays to have larger carrying arterials because that just, as we all know, that means that they stay off of the smaller streets. And every all of us know that it's not unusual to see all of the north-south streets around here lined up for quarter mile to a half a mile for people trying to get across TV Highway every morning, and then the reverse is true in the, in the afternoon. So, you know, you need some larger through streets to carry that, you know. I remember the old saying when they did away with the bypass, build it and they will come. Well, they didn't build it and they came anyhow. Yeah, right, right. So, 
So we, and we know that. Anyhow, I've got some copies of my testimony here. Let me just quickly go over Fine. this and try to move along. Okay, so, um, uh, all right. So the mitigation package, the, 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 the Planning Commission did pass it unanimously, the South Hillsborough Transportation Plan that does include a mitigation package. Um, not funded, but a mitigation package. Now, Hillsborough saying, not firmly committing and how long can they commit into the future anyhow, but they're saying they will make some improvements on, at intersections, like 198th where there's an offset intersection at, Bay, at uh, Blanton, another in offset intersection at 185th Kinnaman where there's an offset intersection at 198th is critical because as I've said, that that's the road they're making into a major arterial through, not major arterial, but an arterial through. And, uh, so they've committed to some funding, theoretically, on the intersections, but nothing to the roadways between the intersections. They've committed the county to that, but the county hasn't committed to that, which is why I was asking whether I'm hoping that maybe we could get some regional prioritization for those kind of rebuilding. Because all of these roads around here are just gravel with oil mixed in them. That they've really only had maybe one ever a little slab of asphalt over the top of them. So they need to be rebuilt totally. Yeah, but they have ditches. Well, they have ditches, they, <laughs> and no sidewalks, and lots of stuff. Anyhow, so um, Washington County's been pretty clear that they haven't agreed about, on this. So really, this, the negotiations over the funding are, are the key thing, and they're about to really get started. Um, one of the, some of the stuff I pointed out in my, my testimony was that there was never any alternate sites analyzed in this. And the, and the reason I point that out is because it's tough to go back and say, well, Hillsborough, you're responsible for X because you made this decision that had these kind of a costs associated. If we were able to compare that to another location that they didn't decide to do, but, but, we, but had a, 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 an estimate of costs associated, we'd be able to more pinpoint exactly how much of it is their decision cost to do here. And uh, which is something I've been pointing out for 15 years. It's a pretty expensive place to mitigate. Whereas if they would have continued the urbanization along 26 where ODOT has a commitment to do, like the, like the residential area of Tannisborn, they would have the residential across the street from the jobs with very little mitigation. So, I mean, those are the two extremes. Um, so, but really, my, I, I pointed out that this east-west traffic on the local streets, um, that there was a, an, a total reliance on the county for funding of the rebuilding of the roads. There was a, really a continued effort by the city to underestimate site traffic and particularly underestimate the livability impacts of an offsite. And then, um, and then and we just made, I made the point where we finally got them to realize that a lot of the traffic they're diverting isn't local traffic, it's arterial traffic. And then in this last time, as I said, I reminded them that um, th in the last testimony, I've got some copies here if anybody wants it, reminded them that 15 years ago, when this decision was made, very few of these people were there and made that decision. They, you know, this decision was made long before it was ever made public. And, uh, they didn't even know have a transportation engineer at the city and didn't for another six years. And so they didn't have any information to base it on in terms of traffic. And um, maybe it was time to call a halt to it and, until they could figure a way out to pay for this thing because um, it's not their decision. I mean, it, you know, they shouldn't feel like they're married to the decision. It's not putting it off forever. It's just saying that it's, not, it's maybe not the opportune time. And I reminded them that 20 some years ago when I was an elected official, I backed this particular piece of property coming into the urban growth boundary. This, the the Ladd and Reed farm, the 450 acres of it. And the reason I did that was because it was being proposed as industrial land. And at the time, the West Side Freeway ran right through the middle of it, so it was completely serviced. And my neighbors were kind of mad at me for doing it. I was the only public official in the whole region that publicly did that. And I explained to them, look, you wait 25 years and all we're going to get is a bunch of apartments and no roads. Maybe that, you know, that's probably what's come to pass. And so, um, you know, it's all, it's, it's all about timing. And, uh, and I understand that the city of Hillsborough likes to say yes to things, but sometimes you do have to say, no, let's, let's get things in perspective. And so that was kind of the thrust of my, my testimony the last time. But it didn't do any good, and now it's going to go to the city council where they're not really going to, my understanding is, and I've got this from staff, they're not going to hold a hearing. 
they're going to discuss it among themselves and uh, and go ahead and go ahead with it or not. And uh, I just have never known that you could have a plan amendment without having a public hearing. But I guess they've got a legal way around it. So. They had a public hearing in the planning commission, so I guess we have a shot. Steve, I gotta wrap this up, but I wanna just jump in with this statement question. Do you agree with this? Don Odermont at an open house at Century High School made this comment at the, the public meeting. He said, things are gonna get a lot better when uh, cities quit building stuff to 99% capacity standards and start planning for the future. Um, I was taken aback by that, and I'm, do you think Don Odermont's really, I think he's steering this in the right process. Do you concur with that? It, it, he's, he's, a he's a blessing. The guy is a blessing. He's an honest, forthright traffic engineer who has really uh, gone to bat for us to help the city understand. I mean, he works for the city, and he's gone to bat for us helping the city understand the impacts. Yeah, that they're creating off-site. Uh, yeah, I just, um, I, I think he's one of the guys that's actually listening, and I wish you could go on for another hour, but I gotta cut you off, and I gotta put Miles <laughs> Garcia up here. Um, so if anybody wants a copy of my testimony, they will see me after. Um, I really need some applause for Steve Warren. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add one more quick thing. Yes. Is, through the Aloha Reedville planning process, a lot of these mitigation process or mitigation streets are built into our plan and hopefully that will help bring them to fruition more and that's on via mike's efforts excellent so you don't know if the health our city council is going to have public testimony on this topic or not i i've been told that they're not yeah. by staff and i believe they're going to discuss it themselves on the 17th okay um you guys are probably going to be tired of hearing this, but our mailbox has been quiet. We've heard that time and time again, I know. We have um, two public notices um, on 176th Avenue, a little bit south of Johnson. There's going to be a two, uh, two parcel partition. That's where there's that divide a lot into two lots and probably build two houses on it in the future. And um, you're familiar with the Chevron station on 170th Avenue and TV Highway? They're remodeling. We got the application for that a while ago, and this is the public notice for it. So they're, um, when I go by gas, then I talk to the people in there, they're really happy that they're going to get a new, a new updated uh, uh, facility. And um, we have a neighborhood meeting coming up. It's at uh, 18255 Southwest Kenneman Road. That's on Kenneman Road. Um, 182 would be three blocks east of 185th uh, in that vicinity. And it's going to be a seven lot subdivision. Um, a neighborhood meeting is on September 24th. And it's going to be at the site, which is at 18255 Kenneman Road. And that's going to be 6.30 in the evening. We have two, uh, two new applications at uh, 1790 Southwest 187th Avenue. That's 187th Avenue, a little bit south of Johnson. That's going to be a uh, three parcel partition. That's where uh, we're going to have a lot, and it's going to be divided up into three lots. And we also have at uh, near 182nd and Johnson, it's uh, going to be a 32 lot subdivision. And uh, there's been some um, applications there before, so this is gonna, this is another application for it, and they're gonna do some modifications to it. Um, and with Planning Commission, we had Planning Commission yesterday afternoon, and um, what we talked about, we're working with North Bethany, uh, different aspects of North Bethany, and we also had a, a, we had three ordinances is what we had. One was North Bethany, and another one was with a, uh, we've changed the home occupation uh, community development code where you have a small business in your house. Uh, one, one modification we made for that was um, uh, previously, I think there was no alcohol allowed in the home occupation permit, and that puts a lot of hardship on bed and breakfast, which is my understanding it's a allowable home occupation. So now if you have a bed and breakfast, you can serve wine and, wine and beer along with your um, along with your bed and breakfast that, uh, business. And uh, what we're gonna be working on next, 
probably in a couple of weeks, we're going to be working with the uh, the new area that we recently acquired from Multnomah County. I don't know if you've been following that in the paper or not, but uh, Multnomah County just gave us some of their area up in the northeastern part of the county, and um, so we're going to be uh, looking at that. And I'm not too sure if it's an ordinance or if it's going to be a, a planning thing. I'm not too sure what it's going to be, but uh, we're going to be working with it. Any questions? In addition, uh, there's a 98 home development up off of Grabhorn that just started. I think the, uh, the permits were done. That's not at the stables, is it? Yeah. yeah it's the stables. Yeah. Oh, the stables. okay, okay. It's the stables. They finally started to clear land. It's, it, we've had the application yeah. five years oh, ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's finally, it's finally got to go. I don't know if I have a copy of it anymore because I, I, I keep applications just for about maybe two years, maybe three at the most. It's a really big, big project, and I might have, uh, I might have already <laughs> recycled that. I might have it. I'm not sure. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah. only got two exits coming out of there. One's dropping down under Farmington, which is going to be a real headache here in the, in the next year. And the other one's going back off of Tremont, which will either they dump back grab horn. on the Grabhorn or go through the other development up there and uh, dump off into gas. Oh, gas. So it'd be, they might have three. Yeah. But you still got to go, go out of that development to get on the Tremont to get out. There's no one, matter what you do. I, I'm going to inject a little bit of my personal opinion. There's a, one of the problems with that is Miller Hill Road. Yep. If we had, well, and, and we're also having a, a subdivision up there on Miller Hill. Yeah, 21 yeah. And, a, and a 4. Yeah, and when you, I don't know, when I drive on Miller Hill Road, uh, there's, and you pass two cars, there's not much room for uh, another car. <laughs> well, they, 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 there's something's going to have to do on that road. Because you, you, now you get those people going through the housing developments, and it's just, and the, there, there was a development coming down, that down, come down on Quarry, but they shut that off whatever reason yeah, I, I, don't know. I, I was told some reason that you couldn't do it because the fire engines couldn't go up there well what is the fire engine you have to go up there they can go up the other road oh so that's that's but that's the 98 unit development you're talking about it's up at the top yeah, of the hill that's yeah yeah well and, and, and Miller Hill's bad too I, I yeah know, but there's a there's the canopy ground. road we, we got Beaverton planning this future up there right now yeah. so uh, and you and you kept mentioning this Beaverton South it's actually Cooper Mountain no, South, South, South and Cooper now Cooper Mountain. Mountain North which comes all the way to Gasner so and I got to make one more comment quick I was at Mike's big meeting here his monthly meeting and the other night and I wouldn't say I jumped on everybody there but there was a there was one person from CPO 7 another person who goes to CPO meetings, and I said, why don't you people go to CPO meetings to learn what the people in Aloha want, need, and what, what information they get to, some information from Metro and different types of things. And I think there might be a few people here tonight, I don't know, but, and I don't know what Mike thought of what I did, and the, and the uh, council, what do you call it? Well, we should person, have- But I'll tell you, I, I was upset that these people don't go and find out what the low up wants. And so you're talking about the low regal study meeting? Yeah. Yeah. Well, but you're you're uh, mentioning that, but I have an announcement too. Our our neighbor our neighboring CPO CPO ten, they meet the third Thursday of the month, like we meet the first Thursday of the month. For their for their mo monthly meeting, they're going to have uh, John Rankin, who is a uh, Financial investment and family planning attorney. If you're interested, we had him here come to our CPO uh, quite a few a few years ago, and it was a very very interesting topic. So if you'd like to go to a neighboring CPO meeting and learn about that topic, and bring your friends and your relatives and neighbors, uh, please feel free to do that. And there's information. I don't know if, we're gonna, if the extension service, what kind of publicity it's going to be, but if you get on CPO or their email list or something like that. CPO 10, you can learn about it. Okay, time to wrap. Folks, uh, uh, I'd like to close the meeting with one last announcement, and that is uh, October is our annual meeting where we elect officers. So we'll have nominations and elections 
And uh, with that being said, y'all have a good evening. See you in a month. Bye-bye.